Well, hello, this is Adam and welcome to Rare Classic Cars. Today we're going to do a porch chat for those who are longtime viewers in the tranquil setting outside here because it's such a nice day in the Midwest in the summertime and not that many nice days in the Midwest period. So let's take advantage of it. But today we're going to address a topic that maybe has befuddled some of you for some time and that is why and how did General Motors make so many different engines? What do I mean by that? So for those who are not aware, if you bought a General Motors car in the 1976 model year or prior, each of the divisions really had their own engines. So despite the fact that, as an example, they were all 350 cubic inches, a Chevrolet 350 versus a Pontiac 350 versus an Olds 350 versus a Buick 350, Cadillac didn't have a 350 aside from the Oldsmobile engine that had fuel injection put on it in the 1976 to 79 Seville. We'll leave that as a topic of conversation for another day. But those 350s really didn't share anything in common aside from some essential parts like carburetors, in some cases spark plugs, distributors, but the actual block and the heads and the intake were totally different across all those divisions. And the same is true for the larger bore and size and big block engines like the 454 from Chevrolet, the Pontiac 455, the Buick 455, the Olds 455, and the Cadillac 472 and 500 really didn't share in terms of the engine itself much of anything. So how and why in the world would General Motors do this? Some would say that, well, no other auto company did it. And it's true, Chrysler had a 440 as an example that it used across Plymouth Dodge and Chrysler. Uh, Ford had a 460 that was a Lincoln exclusive until partway through the 1972 model year when then it proliferated to the Ford and Mercury's in the lineup. But Ford did have, as an example, three 351 cubic inch engines. And I said that right, three. The 351 Cleveland, the 351 Windsor, and the 351 modified engine all three are different from one another, but that's a topic for another day. Let's get back to General Motors. So why did they do this? We're going to bring back the whiteboard here. Why did GM make different engines? Number one reason is scale and scale economies. And this is a graph where the horizontal axis is the number of units. So the more units you produce, you can think about it as you're further out on this axis. Then the cost per unit is this vertical axis. So the higher cost per unit is further up on this vertical axis. And what you notice is the cost per unit is very high when the number of units are small. But then it, it comes down very sharply until a certain point at which you reach, if you want to use and impress your friends, you reach diminishing marginal returns. And what does that mean? It just means that as you increase the units after a certain point, the cost really doesn't come down by any incremental amount. It comes down very marginally, but hardly at all. That's really the point of diminishing marginal returns. And in a number of cases, I didn't draw it on here, after a number of units are produced, you actually have to buy new capital equipment, like a new machining line or a block line. And then this cost per unit actually goes up again it has a little step function change and then degrades over time. So in the auto world, many pieces of machinery and equipment that are arranged together in an assembly line can really make at most 250 to 300,000 units per year before you have to add another line. And what does that mean? That after 250 or 300,000 units, you're reaching this point of diminishing marginal returns after which you'd have to buy a whole nother line and that cost spikes up again before degrading. And this is true of assembly equipment, it's true of machining equipment, it's true of casting equipment. So think about what goes into an engine. You have to basically cast a block at a foundry. In other words, you have to have a pattern and a mold and then you pour liquid metal into that mold that creates a casting a raw casting shape, and then you take that and then you start machining it. You machine out the holes for the cylinders and the coolant passages, etc. And then, of course, you have to polish it. Then you start assembling the engine with the pistons, the valves, and all of that. Then you test the engine, and then it's finally ready for shipment. And that was a 
you know, an abstract level description of what happens, but that's basically it. You cast a block, you machine the block, you assemble it with the components, then you test it, and then you ship it to the assembly plant. Well, each of those steps, if you will, really think about it as though after 250,000 units, you have to invest in a whole other line and you're creating new lines so that you can increase production. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, when General Motors' market share was extremely high, in some cases 50% plus of the U.S. market, the company in each division in particular had the scale such that they were making V8 engines far in excess of 250,000 units per year. And so when that threshold gets passed, it's really not much more incremental cost to do a whole different engine because you're going to have to add a whole new casting line and a machining line and an assembly line anyway. Why not make it different? Yes, you have different molds for the castings. Yes, you may have different, let's say, machining parameters, but you're going to have a whole new line with all new equipment anyway. So there's really not much incremental cost when you have that much scale like General Motors did back then. Remember, some divisions like Oldsmobile were producing a million units per year, the division of Oldsmobile, you know, not Chevrolet, Oldsmobile. So there was tremendous scale in each of these divisions. And from a manufacturing standpoint, it really didn't cost that much more. Second, you got product differentiation, number two there, which was very important. And this is one of the things I love about classic General Motors vehicles is that the engines endow the vehicles with different driving characteristics. Some are more stump pulley engines, some are more upper end revers. The Buick V8, for instance, at least by my perception, is more of a higher RPM engine, even the big block 455, than the other divisions. Uh, the Chevy 454, maybe you put in that camp too in some of the earlier years, but I would put the Buick in that camp, again, in the high compression years at least. And you get different characteristics when, the, uh, when you're driving the car. The other benefit that you get, <clears throat> which maybe isn't so obvious, is that if you have a defect, a design defect or a warranty defect or supplier defect, a lot of times today, auto companies are using the same parts across many different vehicles. And if there happens to be a recall or a defect because of that common scale, you have to recall every vehicle in the population that uses that particular component. So there's a lot of exposure from a risk standpoint. Whereas if you differentiate the product, you use different vendors or you have a different design, you're kind of hedging your bets, if you will, across the portfolio of exposures. And it helps actually manage your risk to some degree too. So differentiation, risk mitigation, you know, and then number three, they also did share some key common components that were tough to develop and required a lot of testing and validation. Fuel systems like carburetors, no matter what GM engine you got, you could get a, generally speaking, a Rochester 2GC or a Quadrajet in the later years. And <clears throat> that was about it if it were a V8. And that was the same carburetor, although with different metering rods or jets or things like that, it was used across the whole lineup. So the carburation and the fuel system development was commonized. From an ignition standpoint, the distributors were common. They may have had different parameters for the point gap and the weights in the distributor for spark advance and things like that. But the overall design was pretty similar. Of course, different shaft lengths for the distributors and some had different locations. The Buick and Cadillac V8s had the distributors in the front. Chevrolet, Olds, and Pontiac had them in the rear. So there were some little differences, but a lot of similarities in the distributors as well. As evidenced by the fact, I love this, any GMs with points have that little window that you can adjust the points through with an Allen uh, screw. Fords and Chryslers don't have that, and I think that's one of the great things about giving the GMs tune-ups there. You just got to get the car to start, and then you can adjust the point gap. So really for all those reasons, it made economic sense and it wasn't that much more incremental cost for General Motors to produce all these different V8 engines. And yes, you did have, let's say, different engineering times. You had on the engineering side and the R&D front, you did have different teams that had to engineer them. That was one cost that was different. But remember, an engine program back in the day was forecasted to last at least 15 years. 
And so that engineering cost would get defrayed over a 15 plus year time period and millions if not tens of millions of units. So in terms of its contribution to the cost per unit, at the end of the engine's lifetime, it was almost negligible. It really was the variable cost associated with the production that was the most expensive after you know, 15 years of producing an engine. So if, I believe it's for those reasons that GM really stuck with this differentiated series of engines until after the 1976 model year. And then in 1977, they started rationalizing some of their powertrain portfolio. All the 455s went away. But then if you wanted a 350 in the luxury cars or the non-Chevy cars, it was often a Buick 350. If you wanted a 400-ish cubic inch V8, it was often the Olds 403 in the non-Chevrolet cars. So that was, and Chevrolet kind of kept their powertrains because that division had the most scale and they could afford to have their own. And then I think the thought was that, well, let's let Chevrolet have a value line of powertrains, if you will. And then Pontiac, Buick, and Olds can have a more premium line. And then Cadillac still has its exclusive engines. So they tried to commonize the Buick, Olds, Pontiac V8 portfolio and really rationalized it down from a bunch of 350s and 455s to the Pontiac 301, the Buick 350, and the Olds 403 for a number of years. Uh, until, of course, they started introducing the even smaller displacement engines like the Pontiac 265 and the Olds 260, etc. So that was as General Motors scale was starting to come down and they had to start rationalizing costs. But even then, like I said, they kept Chevrolet, Buick Olds, Pontiac, and Cadillac had their own different engines. And Buick Olds, Pontiac were kind of thought of as one group. So hope that little porch chat, if you will, out here in the tranquil setting with the chalkboard was enjoyable and you learned something. If you did, let me know. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Check out the video thumbnails at bottom left and right for some suggestions for you as well. Thanks again for watching.